Hello, Harvest family, and uh, welcome to anyone else that is watching with us today. Uh, if you are joining us today and you want us to know that you're celebrating Easter with us, I'd encourage you to fill out a connection card, um, which we have a link to uh, below this video. If you click on, I think it says show more, um, there'll be a link to the connection card, uh, a link to our lyric sheet uh, for our time after the sermon, um, as well as some other helpful links. Um, this video is pre-recorded, but Kai will actually be on YouTube live after this, I think about 1045, so that we can sing together. For the sermon, I didn't want to have any glitch uh, issues as we go, but I thought it'd be great if we could sing together live with Kai. So that'll start at about 1045. Uh, when we started praying about our Easter service and planning a few months ago, we certainly didn't see this coming. This isn't what I pictured. Um, this is not what I would have chosen. And yet, I think that this actually might be one of the most helpful backdrops for us to hear the Easter message in my lifetime at least. The message of Easter has been relevant for 2,000 plus years, but I suspect that if we're paying attention, uh, we're more ready today to hear the good news uh, of the Easter message than ever before. All over the globe, people share similar feelings right now, which makes this pandemic so unique. Uh, many people feel uh, fearful or isolated. Uh, some of us feel trapped. We certainly feel very unsure about our future. Some might feel hopeless or lost. Uh, many of us are just in shock that this is our new norm. I know that I often wake up wondering, like, did I just have a really bad dream? We're closed in our homes because of a disease that is taking life at an alarming rate. We're battling an enemy that we cannot see. And while our enemy, COVID, is different than the invisible enemy Jesus defeated on Easter, I can't help but think that Jesus' followers felt so many of these same things from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Just a couple days before, his disciples were imagining Jesus as king and being in his kingdom with him. They thought they knew what was coming. And then suddenly, they were in a state of shock. I'm confident that they felt isolated, that they felt trapped, fearful, that, that maybe they were hopeless, that they were lost. They were certainly uh, un, uncertain of their future. And I'm sure they woke up Saturday and Sunday hoping, praying that it had all been just a bad dream. But Easter came, and what they found was an empty grave. The angel told them that Jesus had risen from the dead, that the grave could not hold him, that he had defeated death. The resurrection meant life for all who would place their faith in Jesus, the defeater of sin and death. Jesus' followers went from crushed in one moment, and just within days, they were filled with hope because Jesus had risen. If you haven't been to church before on an Easter Sunday, uh, there's this thing that we do. Someone up front says, he is risen, and everyone responds with, he is risen indeed. So let's do that today, even though we're separated from one another. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, uh, this Easter is really different for us, but I hope that um, because of what we're going through, uh, we'll be ready to hear the message, uh, that we'll be ready to hear the good news, the hope that is available in you, Jesus, because you did raise from the dead. Lord, I pray that you'd open up your word to us. I pray uh, for my friends that are listening right now. Will you help us to be attentive even though this is through a screen? Um, God, thank you that we are still able to gather in this way, and we, we just pray that your word would, uh, would be clear uh, as we hear it, as we take it in. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we'll be in 1 Peter uh, 1, 3 through 9. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn there with me. And oddly enough, I chose this passage probably a couple months ago, um, and, and today it's amazing to me how well it fits um, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So let, let me read this to you. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So the question is, where is your hope or what is your hope in? Every person has hope. We have small hopes, we have big hopes. But most of them aren't certain. Most of them are not definite. The hope that Peter writes about to these early Christ followers is very different than the hopes that we often have. He tells them of a hope that is so good he has a hard time describing it with words. This living hope is because of Jesus living. Our hopes in the last few weeks in our world have suddenly shifted. We're hoping that we can stay healthy. We're hoping that we can stretch the money from that last paycheck to the next check. We're hoping that our loved ones stay healthy. We're hoping the stock market recovers. Some of you are hoping that your, your business can stay afloat. And there's nothing wrong with any of those hopes. But all of those hopes are finite. None of them are guaranteed. None are like the hope that is found only in Jesus. A hope that is so different, Peter calls it a living hope. Our first questions about this living hope are all how questions. How is this possible? How does this living hope happen in a person? How has God done this? Verse 3, we get three parts uh, to the answer of those questions. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The first answer to the how question is, how does it happen? It's by his great mercy. Everything God blesses us with is by his mercy. No gift from God is, it comes to us because we deserve it. But it's very easy for us to fool ourselves. Like if we just do some good, then God will owe us something. If we're generally a kind person, if we're fairly honest, if we are considerate of other people, in church people, we particularly struggle with this, right? If we go to church, or right now, if we watch a sermon online, if we give money to a church, or if we give money to a missionary, or if we volunteer, or if we read our Bible a lot, or if we get up in the morning and spend time praying, we trick ourselves into thinking that if we do these things, then God should be good to us. But the Bible's straightforward that every blessing from God is actually out of his mercy. God is compassionate, he's gracious, he's loving, he's full of mercy. I cannot merit his favor. So this living hope comes to us by his great mercy. When he doesn't give us what we deserve, it's because he is merciful to us. We can't look at living hope and think, oh yeah, I had that coming my way. No, it's a gift. God gives me life. Um, God gives me life, God gives me this living hope, not because I'm nice, not because I'm a pretty good dad, not because I, I follow most of the laws, not because I live a fairly ethical life. He gives life because of his great mercy towards me, period. So the first part of the three-part answer is God's great mercy. That's how we get this living hope. Part two he says that we're born again. And if you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, you are born again. Our living hope comes by this new birth. Living hope isn't for everyone. It's only for those who are born again. Reading the term born again probably flashes you back to John chapter 3. Jesus in the night is talking with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a very religious man. If someone could be religious enough to be saved, this would have been the man. But it wasn't enough. Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed transformation, a transformation so radical and so out of his hands that it's like being born all over again. Not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. 
And just like you had nothing to do with your physical birth, spiritual birth also is brought about by someone else. This is God causing you to have this new life. And the Bible lays it out this way. God reveals himself to you, right? He opens up your eyes, your heart to understand the gospel. He gives you new life or regeneration. And then the response is that you believe. And one pastor compares it to fire. He asks the question, which comes first, the flame or the heat? Well, the flame obviously comes first, but as soon as the flame is there, there is heat that you can feel. And similarly, God works in your heart in such a way that he gives you new life and your response immediately is that you believe. God caused it and you respond by believing. I suspect right now that people all over the world are thinking and searching and asking deeper, harder questions about life about eternity, about God, than we were just even a few weeks ago. And I'm confident that God is revealing himself. I'm sure that there are many people watching sermons today that, that just a couple months ago never would have imagined that they'd be in a church on Easter Sunday or watching on YouTube. But God is stirring in hearts. God is bringing about belief in people. And in many ways, uh, being born again is something that we really can't put our finger on. You can't put it under a microscope and study it. When, Nic when Nicodemus hears Jesus talk about new birth, he can't even fit it into a category. Because we're so stuck in the physical world, what we can see, what we can touch. It's difficult to explain. You go from being dead in sin, as scripture describes it, and maybe you cared about religious things, spiritual things, maybe not but you were not trusting in Jesus as your savior. Instead of trusting in Jesus for salvation, we trust ourselves. And a pastor uh, named Tim Keller uh, calls it self-salvation. And there's two modes of self-salvation and it's really well illustrated in Luke chapter 15, the, the story of the prodigal. The younger son, he, uh, he decides that he's gonna blaze his own trail in life. Right? He goes to his dad, asks for the inheritance, basically says, I wish you were dead so I could have your stuff. And then he takes off and lives wildly. He thinks he knows how to best live his life. The second is like the older brother in the story. You save yourself by being a really good person. Religious people uh, are particularly prone to be this way. You do all the good that you know how. And, and while these two look very different, both are forms of self-salvation. The younger brother, he goes off and, and he parties. He lives wildly. Yeah, but then he comes to the end of the trail. And it says that he comes to his senses. He realizes that his way of living isn't working. And he goes back to his father. The older brother, again, he was the opposite. He worked really hard. He was uber responsible. He was a rule follower. He thought that by doing everything right that the father owed him. When the story ends, and the younger brother comes to his senses, right? He's, he's come to the father, but we don't know about the older son. We don't know if he realized that he couldn't save himself, that he needed a savior. I'll ask you, have you come to your senses? Have you realized that you can't save yourself, that you need Jesus? Being born again comes by belief in Jesus. Belief that you needed Jesus to die for you because you were dead in sin. And that's how the Bible describes our spiritual state outside of Christ, that we're dead. Not dying, but actually dead. And when you're dead, you can't do anything to save yourself. You can't resuscitate yourself. You can't put the paddles on your chest and yell clear. You, you're unable to do anything. You need someone outside of you to save you. Jesus alone has the power to save. Jesus died on the cross to save sinners. He died the death that we deserve to die. I love 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus never sinned, and yet he took on our sin, and in our union with him, we become the righteousness of God. He takes our sin, we get his righteousness. Now today, 
People don't think that we deserve death because of our sin. Our culture has been telling us for a long time, we are good, we are good. People my age and younger, we all got trophies just for being on a team, just for participating. We've been pumped full of this notion that at our core, we're good. Now, of course, we know that we aren't perfect, but we don't think of ourselves as bad. We don't think we're so bad that, that we should be condemned. The problem is, uh, we like to compare ourselves to our peers. And maybe compared against your peers, your neighbors, coworkers, maybe you are pretty good, but that's the wrong comparison. The Apostle Paul tells us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we're comparing ourselves, we need to compare ourselves to God, to His glorious standard, to the perfectly holy God, and you don't want to be compared to God. God is nothing like us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We're talking about God Almighty, the creator of all things, who spoke creation into existence. All of our thoughts about God aim too low. We read over and over again in scripture, there is none like you, but we don't grasp how vastly different God is than anyone we know or anything we know. We read about God's holiness, that there's no blemish in him, not even a microscopic imperfection. He's perfect in everything he does. God is the perfectly just judge. And when we stand before him, the verdict is guilty and the verdict is totally right. You know that you aren't perfect, but I suspect that you've had moments where you realize that you aren't even good. We can fool ourselves most of the time, but there are times when we know deep down that we're not good, that we really need to be saved from our sin. There is no living a hope apart from salvation. Living hope is for those who are born again. That's the second answer to the question of how. The third question, how does this happen? Verse 3, it says, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It happens through the resurrection. Jesus really did die on the cross. There's a theory that Jesus really didn't die, that he just seemed dead. In Mark 15, uh, some people come to Pilate and ask, can we have the body of Jesus? Can he be taken down? And Pilate asks the centurion, is he dead yet? And the centurion, who is an expert in people dying on the cross, he confirms that he is dead. So Pilate gives permission for Jesus' body to be taken off the cross and taken to the tomb. And then on the third day, the tomb is found empty. Jesus rose from the dead which we know that Jesus' payment for sin was sufficient because he resurrected. If he had stayed dead and we were told that he died for sin, we wouldn't really know if it worked. We would hope that it worked, but it wouldn't be sure. But Peter calls our hope a living hope because Jesus lives. Our hope is sure. It is a hope that is secure because of Jesus' victory over death. The resurrection is what makes the living hope available for all who would trust in Jesus, who would place their faith in him. Verse 4 uh, tells us what we look forward to. Peter says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Our hope consists of an inheritance that is being kept for you by God. You can bank on it. The believer knows that God is backing this. The inheritance is so incredible that Peter, uh, he struggles to find the right words to capture what it is. So instead of telling us what it is, he tells us what it isn't. Right? He does this because he, he can't find another way to describe this inheritance. So he says, it isn't perishable. It won't be defiled. It isn't going to fade. Our inheritance is imperishable. We don't know anything like that. Everything that we know breaks down. It has an expiration. It it falls apart or wears out. The poet uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's poem is really helpful. He says, The stars shine over the mountains. The stars shine over the sea. The stars look up to the mighty God. The stars look down on me. The stars last for a million years, a million years and a day. 
Uh, but God and I will live and love when the stars have passed away. Our inheritance will never perish. It's eternal. It's undefiled. And we really can't fathom a world that isn't defiled by sin. Right? A world without violence, without theft, a world without security systems or even locks. I had a buddy in college that owned this junker car. It, it was terrible, and he never left it. Uh, he never locked it. He always left it unlocked. And I thought he was just crazy. But his theory was, who was going to break into his piece of junk car that had nothing valuable in it? I know there are parts of our country where people don't even lock their doors at night. Um, for many of us, uh, we can't imagine doing that. Imagine a world where no one's taken advantage of. Right now, scammers are coming out of the woodwork to prey on people's COVID fears. Imagine a world without disease, without death. This world that isn't tainted by, uh, or polluted by sin. It's really easy for us to want our pre-COVID world back. And that will be better. Someday it will be better. But let's not fool ourselves into thinking that the pre-COVID existence can hold a candle to the inheritance that Peter describes here. As I've been meditating on this passage all week and, and living in this new norm that we're in right now as we shelter in place, man, it, is, it has increased my appetite for our inheritance Lastly, Peter writes that this inheritance is unfading, that there's no decay. I turned 40 years old this year. Um, I still think I'm young, but my body is making compelling arguments that I'm not as young as I used to be. I've found that uh, losing a little weight after the holidays isn't as easy as it used to be. Uh, gravity appears to be winning. Uh, my injuries over the past 12 months have just stacked up one after another. I'm likely to sprain an ankle or pull a hammy if I just look at a basketball court or a soccer field. We are fading. And COVID right now reminds us of how truly frail our bodies are, that each body eventually will fail. One day, each of us will breathe our last. And for those who have placed their faith in Jesus, they will be united with him in eternal life. We will one day have resurrected bodies that will not fade for all, all of eternity if Jesus is our Savior. So Peter tells us this hope is secure. It's kept in heaven for you. Then verse 5 who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's guarded. This word means that it's shielded, that believers are shielded by God from the enemy. He's guarding you. Or to borrow uh, the phrase from verse 4, he's keeping you. Right? You aren't out there fighting on your own. No, God's power is shielding you. Believers already possess salvation, but the significance, the full significance of salvation will be fully revealed when Christ returns. Verse 4 told us our inheritance is being kept for you, and verse 5 says you are being kept for it by God's power. Nothing is taking you from God's mighty hand. Christ followers, your worst case scenario in this world is that you are in God's hands as you go through all the trials of life, right? You face nothing alone. God is with you in all of this. No matter how bad life can get, God is with you. Now, the non-Christian, the person who has not placed their faith in Jesus, they cannot say the same thing. Verses 3 through 5, you'll notice they're incredibly uh, positive. They're very uplifting. If you know Jesus, you have this great living hope. You have an inheritance that, it, that we can barely even imagine. But what you don't know, perhaps, about 1 Peter is that Peter's writing a letter to these early Christians who are bruised and battered. They're discouraged. They're weary from all of these trials that they've been facing. And he starts off the book by reminding them of this living hope that they have, and that they can fix their eyes, their gaze on what they have in Christ, not in the world around them that is falling apart, that is unpredictable, that is unrelenting. Verse 6, Peter tells these early Christians what all this means for the circumstances that they do find themselves in right now. Before they, they have the inheritance, 
Peter tells us similarly what this means for us today. Verse 6, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. What are these trials? There's a wide range of meaning for trials. It, it certainly involved persecution for them, maybe physical suffering, perhaps seeing loved ones suffer, uh, could have been loss, could have been a shortage of necessity or, or a lack of, of permanence. He, he starts off verse 6 saying, in this, meaning the truths from verses 3 through 5 result in the believer rejoicing. But just knowing a truth doesn't automatically produce joy, right? Maybe you've been going to church as long as you can remember. Maybe you've heard this passage over and over again. It's not new to you. You know these truths, and yet you find yourself scared. You find yourself stressed. Maybe you even find yourself without hope. So what is the Christ follower's responsibility uh, in response to biblical truth? Well, it's faith. Do you trust God's word? Do you trust what he said? Like you can have a great theology, but if you don't have faith, what does it do? God does the heavy lifting and our part, our response is faith. David Helm, a pastor in Chicago, he says, faith turns sound doctrine into sound practice. Faith makes theological security experiential. All right, this is how Christians can have joy in any circumstance because of their response to the truth of the gospel is faith in God Most High, the one who is all-powerful, the God of great mercy who has already won the battle with decisive victory. And now this doesn't mean that trials don't cause grief. The Christian life is a constant mix of joy and sorrow. This is probably best illustrated when a Christian dies, when, when we grieve the loss of a friend, a brother, or a sister in Christ who has died. And it's even harder a lot of times for us if they're young, if it feels like they, they could have or, or should have had uh, more decades to live. So we're deeply grieved, and yet simultaneously we rejoice knowing that they're in Christ. We rejoice because we know what we deserve outside of Christ, but because of God's great mercy, he saves. So when a Christian dies, we feel the grief and we're able to rejoice. The Christian life is filled with grief and joy. Every day as a Christ follower, there is so much to be grieved about as well as be, to be joyful about. Uh, life is hard, and I think we feel that especially right now. We will be grieved by many trials, a variety of trials. Verse 7 reminds us, though, that God uses those trials. It says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God, he will use the various trials that we go through in life. And it's like purifying gold, right? Burning it with fire to burn away those impurities. God uses trials to burn away the impurities in our life. And one day this faith will result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. I love verses 8 and 9. It says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I am so grateful that Peter, as he's writing to these early, early Christians, that, that they also, we find out they didn't get to see Jesus and yet they believe. Because we, we pretty easily think, oh, if I, could, if I could just go see the empty tomb, right? Or if I could go and see Jesus' scarred hands, if I could touch his side like Thomas did. But Peter writes, even though these believers hadn't seen him, they believed and they rejoice. It's a joy that is so packed that words can't even speak of it. You rejoice because you are saved. You rejoice because of his great mercy. That because he has caused you to be born again, you have this living hope. That because he died and rose again, you have a living hope that is secure. So again, I ask, where is your hope? 
If it's in Jesus, this is a day to be celebrated. Remembering the power of Jesus defeating death, causing us to be born again, giving us a living hope that is secure by his great mercy. But if you realize that you don't have the hope that Peter describes because you haven't trusted in Jesus, I wonder if you would just reach out to the Christian that invited you to watch this sermon or or shoot us a message at the church and we'll give you a call this week. We would love to tell you about the living hope, about why we believe in Jesus. Let's end in prayer. Lord, uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can celebrate that you rose from the dead and, and that by your death and your resurrection, we can, we can have life in you. We can have an inheritance that, that we can barely even imagine, barely grasp what it will be like to be with you alive forever. God, I pray for all my friends watching this video right now, Lord. God, if, if they have that living hope, I pray that no matter what's happening in this world, they would know that you've got them, that they're secure in you. Lord, if there are people watching this video that do not know you, Jesus, I pray that they would consider. I pray that you would stir in their hearts and bring about new life in them, that they would respond to you by believing. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Kai is going to go live on YouTube at 1045. Um, We pre-recorded this just so we wouldn't have the glitch issues, but we wanted to be able to sing together. Even though it's kind of weird, we're in our homes, we're separate from one another, we can sing together at the same time. And today we're actually going to utilize the comment section as Kai is playing and singing. I'd encourage you to type out praises. Uh, You can type out scripture. And and as we sing these songs together, we we can see the praises and the scripture uh, that's on the hearts of our brothers and sisters. I so look forward to seeing you again.